Gonzaga, y'all. Very welcome to the Socratic Club. I'm here to welcome you on behalf of Dr. Calhoun, <laughs> the <laughs> moderator uh, and founder of the Socratic Club, yeah. uh, who is just back from a surgery, and so he said I could luckily uh, still get to be there to welcome you all. The Socratic Club is modeled, uh, our, our Socratic Club is modeled on the Socratic Club at Oxford, founded by C.S. Lewis. And his idea was to bring people together to talk about philosophy, in particular to talk about the way philosophy intersects with Christian faith and how the Christian worldview could be it can, in a, a uh, fruitful dialectical relationship with uh, the philosophical thinking. Uh, we're very lucky to, today to have John Braun. Uh, Dr. Braun is going to give a paper entitled, Is Nationalism a Type of Idolatry? Uh, and then there will be a response by uh, Dr. Roshin Rally. Uh, let me just mention a couple of things. The, there's a sign-up sheet if you're interested in finding out exactly when each Socratic Club meeting will be held. I think we meet once a month in general. Roughly. Roughly, yeah. but there's, it's not an exact date, so you have to uh, kind of stay informed if you want to attend the next talk. And this really seems to be the kind of thing that we are desperately needing in our culture, right? To get outside the classroom, we tend to think of intellectual life to be you do your homework and then you go home and have your social life with your friends. And this is a chance to bring your social life and your intellectual life together. So bring a friend, maybe you can start to come to some of these Socratic Club meetings. Uh, the next meeting is actually uh, shortly, uh, 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 there are going to be three, a series of three lectures on February 19th, 20th, and 21st. Uh, and these lectures are being sponsored by the Gonzaga Faith and Reason uh, Society, which I think would support from the Socratic Club. So let me just mention these. I'm going to read these titles, and hopefully this, at least one of them will grab your interest. Um, there's going to be a talk given by Professor Anna Silvas from the University of New England in Australia. And her talk is going to be St. Macrina the Younger, The Spirit of Holiness and the God Breathed Scriptures. So this is on the 19th of February at 7 p.m. All of these talks are in the University uh, Law School, the Barbary Center. So there's a really kind of a nice courtroom down there for a good place for lectures. So February 19th, St. Macrina, given by this uh, Australian uh, professor, uh, Professor Anna. Silvus. The next day, on the 20th, a Christian invocation, Women as Types of Christ, given by Dr. Catherine Tkach, uh, who is associated with the Ukrainian Catholic University in Ukraine. And then the following day, the 21st of February, also at 7 p.m. in the law school, the importance of retrieving the women of Galilee uh, by Professor uh, Sarah Butler. Um, from the Moldine Seminary in Chicago. So three talks about uh, women in early Christianity. Might be uh, something interesting uh, for you to, uh, uh, to come participate in. Uh, by the way, today is the uh, feast day of St. Agatha in the, in, the Christian, in the Catholic tradition. And she was martyred uh, for being a Christian, ostensibly. But the, the way the story goes, the, the uh, Roman sort of prelate of her territory in Sicily um, made these unwanted sexual advances, uh, and she refused him, and he said, well, look, you're a Christian, you know this is illegal, if you don't give, you know, if you don't, you're not open to, uh, to my sexual advances, we can, I'll out you as a Christian. Uh, and she still said no, so I think there's a strong contemporary relevance uh, with women refusing a men in positions of power, um, to try to use that power as a way to get sexual uh, gratification. Anyway, uh, we're very, very ha happy to have Joan Dorn, so please welcome uh, Dr. Dorn. Thank you. I um, sort of have a handout. Um, could I just put you in charge of distributing it? I'm going to actually steal one, actually, the more I think about it. Um, okay. So I'll stand up here, I guess, because I actually am more comfortable with podiums. Um, how is my volume compared to his? Because he was really good. Is it? Okay. Um, if it's not, tell me at any point, and I will try to amplify myself more. So thank you for that, for that introduction. Um, I've been struggling with this question for a while, but just to kind of tell you a few things. Over the past year, I've been engaged in a research project on specifically hate groups and fascism and white nationalism. This paper's on nationalism broadly, um, although, as you'll see, I'm, I have certain restrictions I'm trying to put on my definition so that we can talk about it more effectively. Because my experience in writing this and in thinking about this is that nationalism is this concept that's 
sort of like the many-headed hydra. It's this monster where you think you've got it and you, you slash off one of the heads, but every time you slash one, it grows two more. Um, so you think you're, you're getting it and you're not um, because it just kind of keeps popping up in new manifestations. Um, but the structure of the paper, which I will probably read a fair amount of, but I'm also gonna probably stop and talk a bit too, um, is based on that original project. And what I was doing was I was looking at two philosophers, Simone Weil, who um, is, uh, was a Christian mystic, and we'll t I'll tell you some more about her, and Eric Fromm, who was a member of the Frankfurt School, which was a group of um, German-Jewish Marxist intellectuals who fled Germany in the 1930s and came to the United States. And Wey and Fromm, Simone Wey and Eric Fromm, were contemporaries. They lived at the same time. They grew up in the midst of World War I and then kind of matured intellectually in the midst of World War II. So what I found in looking at them and trying to apply it to you know, my original project, which was for the Hate Studies Conference on campus and thinking about hate groups, was I found that there was this theme through Wey and Fromm and um, the literature around hate groups that there was this theme of the void and that there was this void of meaning and all three of these things were using this term the void and talking about how there was this void of meaning that was leading people to find ideologies to fill this void of meaning in their lives, explanations of their own identity and of who they were and that this was leading to violence as people were trying to defend their sense of identity. So that was the original project and what I've done is I've tried to broaden it and I think you'll find it's not an entirely successful broadening because I think some of the things that apply specifically to white nationalism don't apply um, to nationalism but I think some of the things do and so we'll just kind of see where that goes. Um, so I, I look forward to a, a good conversation on this and hopefully if you have um, thoughts and things you want to add and um, to my argument that will be helpful at the end will take some time and I'm looking forward to your questions, critiques, um, clarifications, etc. because this is very much a work in progress and I thought about presenting a less work in progress kind of thing, my original paper and I emailed Dr. Calhoun and I'm like I have this thing that's better and he's like no no the work in progress thing is better. I'm like okay <laughs> all right. <laughs> And we also, um, by the way, we have a commentator usually at these things, um, and Dr. Lally will present after me and kind of help us kind of get our discussion going from there. Um, okay, if you want to kind of time me a little bit, maybe give me a 10 minute warning or something, somebody. Um, I'll try, I just don't know when I started giving that intro. Okay. So the question that I've framed here is, is nationalism a type of idolatry? This paper's critique of nationalism employs philosophical methods located at a point of intersection between humanist Marxist and spiritual existentialist frameworks, relying on Eric Fromm, who lived 1900 to 1980, and Simone Weil, who lived 1909 to 1943. So they're born around the same time, but Weil dies much younger. Both were left-wing philosophers from Jewish backgrounds. While Fromm was raised as a religiously practicing Orthodox Jew in Germany, Weil in France was raised by secular Jewish anarchists. Both grew up in the midst of the nationalist fervor and subsequent trauma of World War I, and both matured as intellectuals in the era of the rise of fascism and World War II. Their lives were marked by similar questions. An attempt to ask the question, answer the question, how is it possible, when confronted with ideological idols, in the name of which millions killed, were killed and killed. Simone Weil's work on the void and Eric Fromm's critique of idols and escapes from freedom can help in understanding and critiquing the psychological basis of today's nationalist resurgence. Clearing away idols serves as a revelation of reality, a reality that is initially experienced as empty, dark, and void. Today's resurgent nationalism, I will argue, is a failure to hold open the void the refusal to sit with the void, to attend, and to wait for reality to present itself leads to stuffing the void with phony identities that are always at risk of coming apart, leading some nationalists to violence in order to prevent anyone from pulling away the mask and revealing a self that is still void of meaning. To update an example from Eric Fromm's 1955 The Sane Society, a critique of US culture in the Cold War, I would like to invite you to imagine the following two scenarios. 
both concern offensive uh, behavior, um, I won't use any offensive language, um, quietly think about what would happen in each of these two scenarios, I'll tell you what I think, and then at the end, during question and answer, you can tell me what you think would happen. So this is basically Eric Fromm, I'm just adding a couple things. First, imagine you're in a public park in an average American city, like Spokane, and uh, it's not you know, rural Alabama, it's not Portland, just a typical American town, and you're standing around and you're people watching, and suddenly this guy ascends a platform and starts giving some kind of bigoted speech. So suppose he starts shouting to the effect that all Muslims must die. Genocide is the only solution, he begins shouting. So think about how would passersby react in this situation. Second situation, similar public park, typical American town, Spokane, whatever, not Portland, not Alabama, just Spokane. You're standing around, you're watching people, and then a guy ascends a platform, doesn't say anything, unfurls an American flag, and sets it on fire. How would people react? When I posed this same scenario earlier this week on Facebook, a friend responded that he believed most people would ignore the bigot, but a couple people would challenge him, would say, hey, that's not cool. I don't support genocide. As for the flag burner, however, quote, he would be hospitalized. My prediction is similar, and I don't know what yours is, and I don't, there's not like a right answer here, I don't know, we could talk about it. But my prediction is similar. In the first case, that of calling for genocide, Fromm suggests, most people would feel this is an unethical and inhuman opinion. They would not agree with that statement. But in the second case, a particular feeling of deep-seated indignation arises. The flag burner has committed a sacrilege, an attack on the sacred. He has committed the crime, Fromm says, the sacrilege which is the violation of the symbols of the country. Now it might seem that from the standpoint of the Abrahamic faiths, the first disruptor committed the greater sacrilege. After all, according to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all human beings are made in the image of God. And to harm a single individual needlessly is to desecrate that image. So it's a kind of blasphemy. In the second case, a religious sacrilege didn't occur at all, seemingly, because the flag is a secular and not a religious symbol. Right? So it's not a cross, right? it's, not a, it's, a, it's not a religious symbol, it's a symbol of the state. Catholic theologian William T. Kavanaugh points out that it is only in the modern world that our current understanding of the separation of church and state emerged. In the so-called West, we tend to take for granted the existence of secular public spaces, and we tend to see religion as a matter of private choice. In fact, we even have a tendency to feel superior to societies that don't make that distinction. Kavanaugh critiques the arguments of those who see the Islamic world as more inherently violent to the extent that it doesn't separate religion and public life. While well, someone might say, we go to war for our national interests, not for God, so we're more rational and advanced, what are our national interests? And is our nation really an unreligious, secular, untheological thing? The field of religious studies lacks a consensus on a definition of religion. Is the Japanese tea ceremony religious? It just depends on who you ask. I mean, maybe there's an answer, but there's disagreement. What about the Super Bowl, right? That's a ritual with strong feelings associated with it. If you, uh, if you insulted the Super Bowl, people would be offended, possibly. It is difficult to generate a definition of religion that includes all the things we usually consider to be religions, while leaving out things like capitalism, which I've heard will save us, according to an upcoming lecture, Marxism, which also has a kind of promise of an earthly salvation, fascism or nationalism, and other ideologies. What separates these from so-called religions. If we define a religion according to such characteristics as a strongly held belief system, um, one for which one might even be willing to die, then it would seem that nationalism is a religion. In fact, it would probably be the religion of most Americans. I know many people who are willing to die for their country and they've proven that by serving in the armed forces. But I doubt many Americans will be willing to die for their faith. I don't know if I would. The secular is a modern invention. Although the king and the pope may have had separate realms of control in the Middle Ages, nearly everything was defined in terms of the sacred. 
a medieval peasant didn't have two sets of holidays, Thanksgiving and Veterans Day on the one hand and Easter and Christmas on the other. Everything, all holidays, were religious. When modern nationalism emerged, its aims were partly emancipatory, as Eric Fromm acknowledges. Nationalism seemed to provide an avenue for struggles for autonomy from capricious power. A side effect of the rise of nationalism was what Kavanaugh called the migration of the holy. Rather than creating a, free, a space free of the sacred, where nothing religious is happening, the nation state built up ideologies, rituals, pledges, flags, songs, ceremonies, um, and an, an occult of veneration around the nation state. So the holy or the sacred didn't leave and become private, like over here, this is my church, but instead it, it transferred, right? And so the state and the nation became holy and sacred and inviolable and don't you dare burn the flag and so on. If Kavanaugh is correct, this helps to explain why a genocidal bigot ranting in a park is less likely to be hospitalized than the corresponding flag burner. If there is any unifying religion in contemporary society for most Americans, it might be America. Okay, so that's kind of my intro. Um, part two, I'm gonna use this handout in this section and I will tell you some of the things I think um, I'm talking about when I talk about nationalism. So I'm proposing that we ought to view nationalism as a type of idolatry. Yeah, don't be, it's so sad. Don't, this is better. Um, and what I mean by that, um, I'll tell you quite a bit about idolatry. I have a lot of thoughts about that, but nationalism is the harder thing to define here. So first I'm referring to nationalism as a psychological and social phenomenon. So I'm concerned about the way in which the nation gets wrapped up with our sense of identity as individuals and as, and as members of a collective we, or us, differentiated from the outsider them. And I'm focused on nationalism insofar as the sense of identity is then tied to systems of power, such as powerful nation states or systemic white supremacy. So I'm leaving out, for example, people who are nationalists because they're struggling for freedom from oppression and they're within a state, you know, like Kurdish nationalism or Catalonian nationalism or something like that. I'm focused on nationalism that identifies with systems of power and gets a sense of self through that, uh, through that identification, that it says, I am American, right? This is who I am. Over the past few year years, the world has seen a resurgence of nationalism. As I think many of you know, we have international studies majors here. Um, Trumpism is only the most recent uh, American manifestation. We had Brexit in the United Kingdom, the campaigns of Marine Le Pen and Gert Wilders in France and the, and the Netherlands, victories of far-right nationalist parties in Germany and Austria, um, the, uh, the emergence of, of Hindu nationalism as a force in India, and nationalist movements in the Philippines, and, and just a, and across a, a wide range of countries, this reemergence of nationalism is occurring. Unlike the early modern nationalists, many of whom could have been identified with the left, contemporary nationalism toward established nation states has tended to be on the far right with strong nativist tendencies, including a desire for strong borders and limiting immigration. Over the past year, like I was telling you, I've been studying the resurgence of far right ideologies in the US, especially the ideology actually of White House chief strategist Steve Bannon and why I think that's problematic. And, um, and also of these hate groups, like the people in Charlottesville. Although one could argue that Bannon is a white supremacist, his term for himself is civic nationalist, and he prom or sometimes economic nationalist. And he promotes a vision of American culture in which immigrants and certain international institutions are seen as threats to the down-home Americanism of the forgotten men and women of the heartland. The more overtly fascist alt-right call themselves white nationalists and they advocate for white ethnostates. On their view, countries are united not by culture or their, by their constitution, but by race. Civic nationalism and white nationalism are only two of a variety of many different nationalisms that are at play in the contemporary political scene. In the literature that I have been studying lately, however, because I've been focused on, on the far right, um, new books like Shane Burley's Fascism Today and Alexander Reed Ross's Against the Fascist Creep, um, there's a wider context within which they have these concerns, right? So 
I gave you one definition here um, from Shane Burley, kind of in the middle of your handout. And this is kind of a typical definition from people that are kind of working on researching and understanding what's going on with the far right. But it's not exclusively white nationalism or something. It's just talking about nationalism. But this is kind of what he's worried about. Um, the focus on a nation or ethnic group as an exclusive, and I think the word exclusive there is not too helpful, but like um, overriding or important system of value with morality, politics, and identity being fixed with that group. This can mean strong allegiance to the interests of an ethnic group, race, or sovereign country, yet often denotes a far right uh, wing view of this group as identity, um, as identity, there's some probably word missing there, as identity and as defining organic and superseding other institutions. So that's one definition that's kind of in my mind, right? Here's Eric Fromm, right? So Eric Fromm and Vey are the two people I'm looking at. This is Fromm in the 1950s. This is not so much a lexical definition as it is a persuasive definition, but there's some interesting stuff happening here. Any of my logic students here, former logic students? I'm talking about persuasive versus lexical definitions. Um, nationalism is our form of incest. He's all psychoanalyst too, by the way. Nationalism is a form of incest. It's our idolatry, it's our insanity. Patriotism is its cult of worship. By patriotism, I mean that attitude which puts nation above humanity above the principles of truth and justice, not the loving interest in one's nation, which is the concern with the nation's spiritual as much as material welfare, nor uh, or never with its power over other nations. Just as love for one individual, with, which excludes the love for others, is not love, love for one's country, which isn't part of love for humanity, is not love, but idolatrous worship. Um, so he makes this distinction, by the way, he says, what if somebody said, um, my family is the best family in the entire world. We are the smartest, we are the most charitable, we are the most generous, we um, create peace and goodness everywhere we go, we are the best family in the entire world. People would look at you like you're nuts, right? They'd be like, I'm, everybody loves their family, get over yourself, right? <laughs> But when people say, I love my country, we are the best in the world, we are the most generous, peace and justice follow us everywhere we go, people look at you like you're normal, right? And they say, ah, oh, a patriot who loves her country, right? Even though you would never say that about your family, right? So what is it that, that we're able to attach this kind of identity um, of perfection and this kind of strong attachment to the perfection of our country? Simone Weil speaks of patriotism, and we can talk about the difference between patriotism and nationalism but she's French and patriotism and nationalism are kind of the same, uh, I don't know. We, I'll, I'll tell you more about that if you want. But um, she speaks of patriotism as an idolatrous cult in her book, The Need for Roots. She describes patriotism as a pagan virtue and associates it with ancient Rome. The Romans really were an atheistic and idolatrous people, she says. Not idolatrous with respect to images, like worshiping stone or bronze, but idolatrous with regard to themselves. This is the idolatry of self, which they have bequeathed to us in the form of patriotism. Look how great we are, look how great our nation is. Okay. Part three. Frankfurt School theorist, psychoanalyst, and socialist humanist organizer, Eric Fromm's work, is currently being rediscovered and examined to understand the reemergence of nationalism and right-wing authoritarianism. In 1941, after he'd come to the US from Germany, he published a book called Escape from Freedom, which argued that fascism emerges partly from a desire to flee the burden of freedom. He writes, quote, the structure of modern society affects man in two ways. First, he becomes more independent, self-reliant, and critical, but also he becomes more isolated, alone, and afraid. The experience of freedom created by the modern world is incomplete. It leaves the individual with many negative freedoms, freedom from the state's encroachment on freedom of speech or religion, but without positive freedom, without a sense of what freedom could be for. 
Contemporary humanity, according to Fromm, has gained freedom of religion, but has lost to a great extent the inner capacity to have faith in anything, which is not provable by science, and has gained freedom of speech, but has not acquired the ability to think originally. In Escape from Freedom, Fromm identified three interrelated mechanisms of escape, which he calls sadomasochism, destructiveness, and conformity. These three mechanisms work together, playing off one another, and an individual with strong tendencies toward a particular mechanism is likely to have characteristics belonging to the other two. Destructiveness he links to nihilistic violence. It arises from feelings of powerlessness, feeling threatened by the world, and the stifling of life opportunities and potential. Together with sadomasochism, which views humanity as classifiable according to two static categories, the good strong winners and the bad weak losers, destructiveness is often a defining feature of the authoritarian personality, according to Fromm. Not all acts of aggression are evidence of this destructiveness, though. Action in self-defense or fierce competition in a sport are not evidence of a destructive personality. By contrast, the destructive personality has a totalizing destructive aim. It takes vengeance against the world for its own unlived life. Now, Simone Weil, a contemporary of Fromm's early life, was a philosopher, a spiritual writer, and social activist. And she engaged in a very similar study to Fromm's of the destructive character. Her own social action included some brave experiments in solidarity and suffering, including working as a factory worker just voluntarily and writing about factory conditions before joining the resistance to Franco's fascism in the Spanish Civil War. Following an unexpected religious experience in a Portuguese shipping vi fishing village, Vey's writing took a Christian turn. She identified Christianity as preeminently the religion of slaves, and she sought to synthesize her religious experience with her commitments to worker solidarity and social action. Vey classified destructiveness as one of various possible compensations, similar to Fromm's Escapes from Freedom. Through compensations, the individual replaces the frightening encounter with an unclear reality with a safe encounter with idols. We might add, and Vey would likely agree, that modernity increases the temptation to rely on compensations, since societies don't come with obvious meanings and narratives attached. And in modern multicultural societies, there are many more narratives available to pick from. However, this lack of pre-assigned meaning is also somehow the human condition, if certainly exacerbated by the present. Even if society presents only one or a few possible explanations or narratives to the individual, like this is who you are, this is who we are, this is what it all means, even if there are only a few of those options available to you, there's always a sense in which reality exceeds those explanations, in which those explanations fall short. And idols provide temporary relief from the knowledge that this um, explanation falls short. So there's a, a fundamental void of meaning, according to Vey, that, that's at the heart of reality, and at the heart of every human being's struggle to make sense of life in the world. But this void shouldn't be bypassed. But it's the point, rather the point at which the divine reveals itself, according to Vey, and the point at which the sacredness of each human being can be known. So I'll show that both Fromm and Vey see destructiveness as a type of idolatry that tries to flee this void or fill the void of meaning. Am I doing okay on time? So Simone Weil, like Fromm, saw destructiveness as a response to suffering. Weil wrote that whoever suffers tries to communicate his suffering either by ill-treating someone or calling forth their pity in order to reduce his suffering. According to Vey, when we try to expel our suffering through inflicting suffering on another, we do so because we know that it works, unfortunately, at least in the short run. We do feel a sense of relief. The continual downward distribution of suffering that results is a factor that makes for social stability, maintaining order and comfort at the upper levels of society while nearly, with nearly everyone able to displace suffering onto someone lower in the social hierarchy. When one is unable to command sympathy from others or unable to expel one's suffering onto victims through small, subtle acts of sadism, like please wait at the end of that line for the next hour, 
Vey suggests, a nihilistic type of violence emerges. Then, according to Vey, we attack what the universe itself represents for us. Every good or beautiful thing becomes to be, comes to be felt as an insult. Destructiveness, according to Vey, is a way of compensating for the void. There are other possible compensations she lists, like mindless pleasure, Netflix, a shallow hope for oneself or one's children of occupying a different place in society. Uh, revolution can be a compensation, she says. Revolution as ambition transposed to the collective level. Although some might read this critique of revolution as a conservatism in Vey, suggesting that the revolutionary is never justified, one could also read her critique of revolu revolution as a critique of compensation or of revolution as idle. And here there's a very interesting parallel to Fromm. The Marxist Fromm echoes Vey's critique of revolution as compensation or idle in his essay on the revolutionary character. He contrasts the true revolutionary with the fanatic. The fanatic, according to Fromm, is exceedingly narcissistic and extremely unrelated as any psychotic person is to the world outside. The fanatic has chosen a cause, whatever it might be, political, religious, or any other, and deified this cause, made it a god. He's made this cause an idol. In this manner, by complete submission to his idol, he receives a passionate sense of life, a meaning. For in his submission, he identifies himself with the idol, which he has inflated and made into an absolute. If we want to choose a symbol for the fanatic, it would be burning ice. He's a person who is extremely passionate and extremely cold at the same time. He's utterly unrelated to the world, yet filled with burning passion, the passion of participation and submission to the absolute. Idolatry, in Fromm's sense of the term, is not restricted to specific religious practices or beliefs, but it's a technical term akin to the Marxist term reification, which refers to human submission to the authority of mere things, like the market says we must do X products of humans' own creative action. Through idolatry, the self is deadened. It becomes lifeless like the products of labor that it worships. Idolatry for Fromm includes nationalism, racism, and other things, other ideologies, and priestly, as he calls it, priestly, blindly bureaucratic institutional loyalties. Clearing away idols is not about removing symbols of transcendence. So it's not about getting rid of all the statues from the church for from, or about preventing relating to objects as manifestations of the divine. Rather, in the Frommian and Valian sense, idolatry is about exposing illusions so that truth can be known. Fromm links idolatry to ideology. Ideology, in the traditional Marxist sense of the term, implies a false belief system. It's not a neutral worldview. Ideology depends on the idolatry of words, according to Vey, having the power to detach words from their effective or emotional meaning, leading individuals to repeat doctrinal platitudes that lack actual bearing on life praxis. In the 1950s, for example, Fromm said, if you ask Americans, are all men created equal, they're all going to say yes. They're all going to say that because it's in the Declaration of Independence, it sounds religious, they were taught it as children, everybody will say all men are created equal. But if you ask people in the 1950s, are whites and blacks equal, not everyone's going to say yes. And he says the slogan, all men are created equal, was just that. It was a slogan for these people. It wasn't a living idea that could have bearing on crucial questions of US society like segregation and Jim Crow. Although everybody agreed that all men are created equal, this idea was an idol. It didn't emotionally impact them. Vey engaged in a similar critique of ideology in her essay, The Power of Words. And there she writes that the worst and bloodiest conflicts center around words whose meanings are unclear. Nationalism in particular, she writes, serves to fuel conflicts around unclear aims. It is the very concept of the nation that needs to be suppressed, she writes, or rather the manner in which the word is used. For the word national and the expressions of which it forms a part are empty of meaning. Their only content is millions of corpses and orphans and disabled men and tears and despair, she writes. To return to the compensations for the void, clearing away idols like nationalism is a revelation of reality, a reality that is initially experienced as medieval mystics suggested 
and as Fromm and Weh applied to their context, as empty, dark, and void. On Weh's account, personal identity can't be uncovered through the manufacture of lost ethnic identities or veneration of the nation state, because one's true identity is uncovered only through self-emptying, or what Weh calls decreation, so like the opposite of creation, uncreating. Self-emptying, or kenosis, has a role in Christian theology. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, I don't really have that memorized, um, but it's in the paper, so I probably was right, I checked at the time. Jesus is described as having emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and his followers are exhorted to a similar self-emptying. This biblical reference, as well as Friedrich Nietzsche's rejection of Christianity's affinity for the weak, calling Christianity a religion of slaves, is likely the root of Weh's statement that she felt she belonged to Christianity as to the religion of slaves. Weh distinguishes decreation from destruction. Decreation of the self, of our idols, etc., isn't violence turned inward against the self, but a creative principle. According to Weh's philosophical theology, God himself engaged in decreation. Only by withdrawing in part from creation could God, who is being, create something other than himself. Human beings can participate with God, according to her, by decreating themselves, withdrawing from their ego and their identification with their self-descriptions. Like, I am an American. What holds us back from decreation is our knowledge that after clearing away idols, reality is initially experienced as void. We know about the void in advance of fully facing it because we periodically experience the terror of the void when we momentarily release our grip on our idols or glance away from them before turning back to them in fright. Periodic loss of one idol might lead us to quickly replace it with a new one. Consider how quickly recovering addicts tend to convert to new religions. No doubt some of these conversions are sincere confrontations with the void. Somebody had to face this reality that they'd been fleeing. They peered into the void without the help of their past crutches and something appeared there to them. They had an experience of the transcendent of some kind. While others may have rushed into the arms of faith in pursuit of a new compensation for the void. The freedom of choice combined with apparent meaninglessness that one experiences with the loss of idols is terrifying and it can lead one to seek out authorities, divine, human, or otherwise, to which one can submit. Although Fromm abandoned theism in his late 20s and moved away from the orthodox Jewish religious practice of his upbringing, he speaks in a similarly mystical way about what Weh calls the void. A number of influences are at play, including Fromm's continued appreciation of the tradition of Jewish negative theology. Despite not being a religious believer, Fromm never lost a passion for the power of the mystical negative way. He found elements of the same process of purification from idols in Zen Buddhism and corresponded with the Catholic monk Thomas Merton about the same theme. Towards the end of his life, he began work on a book on Karl Marx and Meister Eckhart, arguing that the 19th century radical communist Marx and the medieval Christian theologian Eckhart had a common commitment to being over having to encountering reality as changing and incapable of being possessed, as opposed to identifying with fixed and static idols, such as personal ego, God as an object of knowledge, commodities, and ideologies. Fromm identified an atheistic character in the writings of the Christian Eckhart and a religious messianic quality in the writings of Marx. His work on Marx and Eckhart forms a humanist counterpoint to Simone Weil's view that some who profess atheism might simply be devoted to the non-personal attributes of God. They might have an attachment to beauty, to goodness, or to truth. Both Weh and Fromm complicate the usually stark division between atheism and theism, such that they are clearly one or the other, not because they find the question of God's existence meaningless, but because they're more concerned with the true faith of the individual, which underlies his or her ideological slogans. Religion as mere compensation for the void is less like real faith than sincerely professed atheism, according to Weh. Atheism plays a role in leading the individual into the void, she writes. It can be a purification through which the divine can be encountered, a means of clearing away idols, a temporary stage in a sort of spiritual journey. Of course, Weh also realized that atheism, like religion, can serve as a, as a compensation 
a stuffing of the void with ideology. A mysticism that seeks God in sacrifice, self-emptying, poverty, and conceptual silence isn't anything new. And Vey's mysticism resembles that of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, Meister Eckhart, other medieval thinkers. However, few recent thinkers have applied such mysticism to a study of social and political problems, and especially to the problem of resurgent nationalism. Vey's attempt to do so is a major reason why her theoretical work is an original contribution. Nor do we often think about who our natural allies become if we grounded our worldviews on a refusal to fill the void or on what Fromm calls the shared or the common struggle against idolatry. If Vey and Fromm are right, then a Christian like Vey has more in common with an atheist like Fromm than either of them do with nationalists, whatever the latter's professed faith. Both the Veilian mystic and the Frommian atheist refuse to fill the void. Okay, I'm almost done. The loss of idols is not a loss of truth and meaning, but reveals the fundamental human need for meaning and the ways in which that need can't be met by superficial ideologies. The absence of past idols reveals reality, allows it to breathe and speak. According to Vey, the void is felt as separation from others and from God, and this separation reveals a something more, a yearning of the human heart that makes what lies beyond perceptible through its absence. In her essay, Metaxu, the Greek word implies both separation and connection. She writes, two prisoners whose cells adjoin communicate with each other by knocking on the wall. The wall is the thing which separates them, but it is also their means of communication. It is the same with us and God. Every separation is a link. Refusal to fill the void need not end in suffering. For Vey, I think it does. And she dies a young, very sad death, which some people think was a suicide. Um, but instead, Fromm argues, the refusal to fill the void can be the basis of a common struggle against idolatry. The formation of new communities, new identities, and social movements around the shared project of building of embracing living ideas and, unf and unfolding traditions instead of dead concepts and idols. This common struggle unites humanists of all stripes in defense of reason and compassion. Those who participate in the common struggle against idolatry, he writes, must be able to talk from their heart and to the heart. They must not fear to displease anybody and must consider that reducing hate and arrogance within themselves must be one of their daily efforts. And so I cut off my last section which was from my paper over the summer, uh, which Roisin has read. And, but there I, I, I went through and I looked at what the white supremacists were saying. And a lot of them are talking about a void. And they, that's how they recruit people. They say, oh, you have this meaninglessness in your life and I can fill it. It's not an argument. They don't really make an argument. They appeal to people's sense of, of meaninglessness and void. And then they offer to plug that with this ideology. So I don't know exactly whether nationalism does exactly the same thing, but I think it at least sometimes operates that way. And that's what I would like to talk about, if you have thoughts on that. But first, Dr. Lally has prepared comments. I hope that wasn't too terribly long. I lost track of time. So this is just um, about four minutes, maybe four and a half minutes. So I won't keep you long, in other words. Um, and I've got three questions for you, John, okay. at the end of it. Or yes. Okay. She narrowed it down from four, so I feel better. I did, actually. It's going to be four. <laughs> I thought four, that's hard. I don't know I if I can do it. OK, yes, go I, ahead. I, I, I didn't want to take over all the questions, so I have three. Um, so John Brown carefully traces the complexities and the ambiguity of the rise of our current authoritarian politics, which he admits is not a question of politics, but rather emerges from a sense of loneliness and of weakness that crosses the political and religious divides. She reads effortlessly through the history of the rise of fascism and how the fascist self is formed by looking at the works of Simone Bay and Eric Fromm, who both incidentally reject their Jewish roots and lived through the existential crisis of World War I. Uh, Brown argues that both Bay's and, and Fromm's work is ultimately a quote, a response to a crisis of capitalism and void of meaning opened up by that crisis. A void opened up by the acute, uh, another quote here, acute emotional, physical and social trauma and loss of life. A void that opened up the space for political extremism. 
So she illuminates the malaise at the core of the fascist movement where from writes, fascism emerges partially from a desire to flee the burdens of freedom. Which is very interesting claim. So on one hand, Brown sees the limitations of Bai's work as entering into a space devoid of community and an impoverished life that ultimately leads to spiritual loneliness. On the other hand, according to Fromm, in fleeing the burdens of freedom, humanity becomes at once more independent yet isolated, more self-reliant but alone, more, cri more critical but um, afraid. So thus the freedom becomes a negative freedom, that is, freedom from state intervention, freedom from religion, and freedom <coughs> from imposed structures of speech, submitting instead to anonymous parties, public opinion, and common sense. So in sum, I, I certainly agree that there is often the case that we do reject the difficulties of life by creating false but comforting illusions. And that these illusions then function to keep us wrapped within our, our, ourselves, trapped in our own fantasies. Maybe. Further, as we do hold so tenaciously to these illusions, we are cut off from the transformative power of the new, in that sense. To use the words um, of Vail and from, we create idols that trap us in our world and keeps from being open to the void. From does great work in showing us this mechanism, how it works, and where the fascism fits into this conceptual framework. It emerges from times in which the constructions that purport to give us meaning begin to crumble. In the Industrial Revolution, and again in the Second Industrial Revolution, brought about by computer technologies, old communities and sources of meaning break down. And to make matters worse, for the middle and poorer classes, something that she addressed in the third section of that paper that I read, but um, it wasn't mentioned here, um, such as material pleasures or the myth of progress no longer functions to make life bearable. So that instead of facing into the void, fascists are tempted by false sources of meaning, such as racism, etc. So now uh, the questions. The first one is, the first is um, on social and Sometimes it seems that what you're trying to say is that all sources of meaning are, are idolatrous or bad. My father, for example, he loves music, and we spoke about this before. He loves the Irish music, he loves Irish literature, he loves Irish um, sports. So he, he really loves the Irish tradition in a way that you know makes him a nationalist. That's what we would say, right? We love our nation of culture, and we've got lovely Irish music as well, and that's what he plays. Now, on the other hand, my mother, which I would call an internationalist, maybe, she loves classical music. She's from Dublin, so one is from the West of Ireland, which is deeply rooted in, in tradition, religion, and a sense of place. Whereas from Dublin, which is the other side of the country, and is more, much more international. It was influenced by the Protestant Reformation, maybe. It was certainly influenced by the English um, and the French. And, um, and my mother was influenced by the a turn towards classical music and maybe uh, all of the literature coming from that, that side. So, um, so there must be something good in both of those, right? There has to be something in, in both of those ways of thinking. So it, 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 I can't see that it could be bad to love that kind of, of um, culture, I want to say, uh, or tradition, or nationalism. Um, but those things give us a shared identity, and, and that also gives us a meaning. So it gives us a shared identity. It also gives us a shared meaning. So, but are they not adulterous? Like, are they not idol? Uh, is that not an idolatry that you're talking about? I'm not sure. It's, it's unclear. So, in other words, if we accept that some nationalism is good, and I hope that we can accept that some nationalism is good, I certainly uh, do have uh, criteria to have to distinguish good and bad nationalism. Now that's uh, that's not number one question, and then the second question is an economic um, or ideological question, which is to stand up against corporate capitalism. We need communities. We can't be isolated individuals, or we really can't stand up against it in the in the, um, in the end of the day. But a community needs something to believe in in order to hold it together. Again, this is you know banging up against this notion of nationalism. It seems that this radical notion of idolatry actually functions to isolate us as individuals and then maybe supporting the corporate capitalist world in the end. So I'm not sure about that. Um, and maybe third is a bit more philosophical and more ontological question, which it seems like 
convey and post-structure this to lover, that's Derrida, Marianne, Levinas, and Kostebe, uh, make a radical bifurcation between the void and the idol. But can we not think of those as integrating into a situation where actually within the void we some sort of meaning can actually emerge? So that so the anxiety would be that in 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 base term of sitting by the void, you know, that the reality in some form of reality will emerge itself. But is there not a space where, because that ends up in loneliness, as you do say, um, um, is there not a way that we can actually enter into the void um, in a meaningful way and integrate those? Loneliness? Is it, so instead of standing, sitting by the void, that they would have, that we enter into the void and that we can create meaning within the void? Um, and, that, and there are the three questions. Um, I'm going to need some help from you, but I'm going to try to talk through it. Yeah. Um, not because you weren't clear, but because my mind is going to be like, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to take the first one, though, I think I, think I can talk about the difference between idolatry and um, I'm going to stand up actually because I feel like I've better heard. Um, so, the first question about the difference between idolatry and um, Like, and, and sources of meaning. Are there sources of meaning that are not idolatry? I think it's part of what we're saying here. And I love the example of Ireland. This is partially why I was, I was glad that Roshin agreed to, to do this presentation. Um, and I, I really, I, like, I really appreciate Irish nationalism because it has this whole tradition of like struggle for freedom and you know against the colonial British. You know, there's this kind of freedom struggle element to it. Um, so okay, so idols versus. Um, Meaning, the, the relationship to an idol is, um, according to Fromm and Bay, according to Fromm at least, it, it's a kind of deadening relationship. So I end up submitting myself to this idol. So when something happens that challenges uh, my attachment to the idol, I have to kind of block it out. Um, so like when evidence emerges that my country is not always great and always the most charitable and always the most generous and always the, the peacemaker in the world and so on, I have to find ways to defend myself from that understanding, um, which I don't think Roisin's mother would do. I just, I don't know her. <laughs> but there is a kind, there's a way you can kind of, you love certain things with a sort of genuine um, affection because you are comfortable to them and close to them. I was supposed to do something with C.S. Lewis, I promised I would and I didn't. Um, but C.S. Lewis and the Four Loves, one of the four kinds of love he talks about is a kind of affection. Like you feel a certain affection for people just because you're always around them. Like if you wait at, on the bus at the bus stop with the same person every morning, you feel, and you maybe say, good morning, how are you, how's the weather? You, over time, you develop a certain affection for these things that are kind of familiar, which I think is different from wanting to go, feeling the need to go on the attack when those things are, are challenged or questioned. So that's kind of my um, my take on that. Um, and I think you can still have sources of meaning, you can still have belief systems. I mean, Bay is a Christian, Franz a Marxist, you can still have belief systems, but the relationship you have to your belief system is different if it's not an idol. So it challenges you, you don't know, block out reality in order to understand it. Um, you're open to seeing it changing and evolving. It's not this tradition you have to defend as sort of fixed, but it continues to evolve and transform. Um, like if there are new Irish poets that come along, they're also great, we incorporate them, we don't just yell at them and say they're not gates. Um, <laughs> all right, <laughs> so that's my take on the first one. Um, but I have to be honest, all I have written down in the second was economic supporting. <laughs>
algorithm and it, everything is fitting into that algorithm. I mean, that's, we have to get into the void in order to resist the, what, what's going on, right? Yeah, and I think to some extent my paper is a call for, for silence, you know, for kind of shutting off the machines and shutting off Facebook and Twitter for long enough to be able to face the reality that we don't have a clear um, sense of self and a, and a clear sense of community that's really sustainable. And we have to kind of encounter that reality, I think. Um, and so silence and kind of withdrawing from all those things to be helpful. Um, I don't know to what extent we really are in uh, a different, if we think about the kind of different economic moment we're in, um, technology is part of that, but we're also in a different kind of economic moment um, because of this, this sense of instability that I talked about in my paper that she read. Um, where there's this term people are using now, the precariat, and they're calling people your age the precariat if you're not economically stable and sufficient yet. Um, because the idea is that we're in this kind of precarious, precarious state. Um, you're all going to have massive student loan debt for the most part. Um, there are all these temporary jobs you have to go through. You have to have unpaid internships before you can have paid ones. And you have to have had internships in order to get unpaid internships and so on, right? And so everyone's kind of living at home until they're 30 and, and, and they're selling socks on Etsy or something, right? Um, so what do we do? <laughs> um, I mean, there, there's this obviously a need for, I don't know about obviously, but there's probably a need for like a social movement that deals with these kinds of issues, right? And according to Fromm, as a Marxist, Fromm sees capitalism as just another idol. It's this thing we've produced and we assume we can't mess with it and he thinks we can. It's a human product like any other economic system. Um, and we can, we can change our economic system to ensure that people are not in this precarious position. Um, the last one, um, about entering into the void. Should we enter into the void? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? Should we? I don't know. <laughs>
Joe, do you want to field questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, I just, I was wondering, could you explain a little bit more the difference between good and bad nationalism? So I, I think you think that there is some nationalism that is good. Is that right? Um, I guess I would say I think there's. Um, okay, so I don't think. Um, feeling identified with your nation um, in relation to systems of power and getting your sense of identity from that is good. Um, so that's the kind of thing at the top I think is don't do that. <laughs> um, I do think nationalism is a kind of patriotism. Um, depending on what we mean by patriotism, could be okay. Right? So I think now, if patriotism is a cult of worship around nationalism, which Obama calls it, then no. Um, but if patriotism means you feel you have a certain obligation to improve your country specifically, um, not an obligation that excludes your duties to other human beings outside your country, but your sense that this is my particular domain where I have particular duties, I think that would be okay. I think a sort of affection for your country and for um, and for its culture, so to speak, is fine, as long as you're open to that, um, to that notion of culture not becoming an idol. Um, so people have this, like, what is American culture? And, you know, it's, it's kind of always adapting and growing and changing. Um, and I also, I, I think nationalism as just sort of a political statement about whether there should be nation states is a totally different thing than what I'm trying to do. So should they, I don't know, I'm not even kind of addressing that particular question. Could I follow up? Sure. Um, so I don't know how familiar you, you are with Alistair McIntyre, um, but he thinks that like our identities are bound up with our families and our communities and our nations, and that that's actually going to shape the sorts of obligations that we have. Mm -hmm. um, is that would you would you say that would you agree with something like that? Would you say? Um, to a point, but it also kind of worries me because I do think there's like another level of obligation. And I also think, um, like I often talk to my students about this line from this um, medical ethicist, Paul Farmer, who talks about going to find your neighbor. And if you think about, if you're like, oh, I'm a Christian, I have to help my neighbor and love my neighbor, and your neighbor is only people in your country, then that's going to have relate to certain problems because, especially if you're in the first world, right? And your country's wealth is partially the product of having uh, colonized other places or taken you know, wealth in, from other countries and you're in this kind of prosperous situation, you're looking after your own here, then that can kind of cause some ethical problems. But I think ideally, um, if we were talking about an ideal situation and we happen to be organized into countries, um, the idea that you would prioritize the needs of a certain regional area, I think is logical. Um, but I wonder about whether we want to prioritize our countries that we have set up now, um, or how much you want to do that? Yes. So, yeah, just going back to the love of community, and I missed, sorry, I got lost. I missed the uh, first part of your talk, but we had a conversation a couple of days ago. I want to sort of paraphrase what I think you were saying in response to Russia's questions. And I'm possibly totally wrong, but I want to see what you mean. I think you're asking for what constitutes an idol. Maybe the first question. How do we know an idol? I think what you were trying to say, oh, sorry, I shouldn't be trying to say, what you were implying was that ideology is what constitutes. Ideology in the Marxist sense that Campbell and Stewart is a characteristic of the idol, whereas the true vision is the not idol whatever that true vision is. On the second one, I thought the point you were getting at was as an alternative to atomization and powerlessness in the face of global capitalism and whatever, mm -hmm. don't we need some kind of collective identity? And that, that raises the question, is nationalism always bad? The kind of nationalism you're talking about, the nationalism of a national liberation movement or the nationalism of Nazi Germany Entirely different things. Uh, Tom Nairn, if you've ever heard of him, he argues that nationalism can have to become a form, a defensive mechanism against imperialism, against globalization, against all that, as a liberating, a liberating thing. The third question, what you were talking about, the thing about silence. Uh, I want to sort of read this and uh, misread it. So 
the ideology is the false idol. Uh, the true vision then would be something like, I suppose, in a kind of Kierkegaardian sense, uh, Christianity, and the silence is the still quiet voice kind of thing. That's one reading of it. Uh, but this thing of being engaged, entering the void, well, that's existential. Mm -hmm. Isn't it really? That's really being authentic. That's, that's really existential. Is that what you mean? I don't know if that's a question. Yeah, the problem is that it is a very um, phenomenological kind of existential motif. But that's the, that's the notion of the void. So there is a problem with that. Already, if, we're talking, if you're talking about um, phenomenology hitting up against that void, you know, there's no place for phenomenology there. So, so then you enter, so what do you do with that? What do you do with that? Um, when you want to say authenticity, I'm not like uh, a huge fan of authenticity in uh, existentialism. I'm not, you know, I, don't, I just don't um, submit to that way of thinking. But at, at the same time, we do need to talk about the stuff that's in the void. We have to talk about it. So how do we talk about it? Um, but is I don't there know. Anything, it's, is there anything in the, in no, the world there beyond, be, what, we, yeah, should, beyond should, what we make of it? Yeah. And that's where it should be empty. existential. Yeah. It should be an empty, I think it should, it should be an empty void, right, John? Isn't that what you're saying? That this, this is what Faye is, is trying to get at, this kind of empty. Yeah, the empty I mean, we're not putting anything into it. Yeah. If there's anything that comes out of the void, it should come out of the void itself and not, not from us. It's kind of the idea, yeah. I think, um, I want to can, I, can I speak for students here and just say, explain that? I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, what, what, what is this? There is nothing there. I mean, so we're talking about existential um, the sense that there's something about my life that I don't understand. That was the objective. Uh, right. 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 well, that's why I'm asking, what are you thinking about this? Or what is they thinking this point is? So I'm, I'm hesitant to like. So there is a certain there's a certain absence I think um, within um, within human life just in general of explanation and meaning, um, and that's partially. I mean, it's there's suffering in human life. There's death. There's stuff that makes no sense. Um, and our tendency is to want answers, you know, right away to those problems instead of sort of sitting with them and letting them be mysteries and kind of encountering them, instead of just describing and explaining and answering them as questions. Um, so there's a, there's a distinction between the philosopher um, Marcel talked about the distinction between a problem and a mystery. Like if my computer's broken, I can just fix my computer, right? But the fact that I'm going to die or the fact that there's suffering in life might not be problems I can just fix. Like there are people that think that way, right? They're like these executives in Silicon Valley, they're like, we're going to cure aging, and we're going to like be melting machines, and we're going to be immortal. And, but I don't think that. I think there are things that are mysteries that we just encounter as mysteries, and we have to wait for them to kind of um, reveal something to us. So the, so the problem of the void is partially a problem of like, I'm going to like provide answers, these simple kind of answers to this Absence, yeah. John, again, so uh, when Dr. Lally talked about phenomenology, it means the study of what comes to appearance. And my worry about this way of thinking, which gets picked up much more powerfully with people like Derrida and, and uh, Levinas and some of the later French tradition, is there's the void, which is this, that's where real um, truth is. You have a choice between an idol, which is what comes to appearance and which can be known but which is also yes. a, 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 a trapping you within imminence mm -hmm. and your own kind of idolatrous self-projections, or you have no, the nothing. And, there's, and, and so if it appears, then it's an idol. Mm -hmm. If it's meaningful, if, if it's something that gives you meaning, then it's an idol. And, and that's where I think this kind of bifurcation is. Yeah. I mean, we sit in the, the sudden sun setting as we as the, <laughs> so this thing coming to, it's coming to appearance, mm -hmm. and it gives my life meaning. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that Dale has a place for that kind of, uh, oh, that which can be yeah. known, and that which can be appear, can be touched, can be felt, mm -hmm. and there is a, a, a theological underpinning here, right? I mean, there's a way to sharpen this point theologically, and that yeah. is, what what's the role of doctrine? If, if you're going to say all doctrine is always ideology, and we should just be silent in the face of the void, then that means the only religion that's true religion. I actually caught this 
in your comment where you paraphrase uh, of a saying something like, sincerely held atheism is more religious than adherence to Christianity, which strikes me as... Mm -hmm. That's not quite what you said, I'm sorry. Okay, well, <clears throat> there's a danger of condescension here toward uh, traditionalism. I'll go back to your way of putting it in terms of your, your dad's... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, his love for things Irish. Well, I mean, you can think about uh, an ordinary non-intellectual religious person's um, uh, adherence to and love for um, practices and rituals of, of the church, for example. Yeah. And um, it's easy, it strikes me that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I always hear the warning of, of Kierkegaard here who talks about wise and simple and that we all stand alone, we stand uh, equal before God. And so the intellectual always has to avoid the the, um, the idea that, oh, well, you have to have this intellectual experience of the void or or you're living in uh, uh, inauthenticity or you're living a, an illusory faith that's, that's false. And it, it seems, I, I worry about this, this um, uh, I don't know, this idolization of the void, sounds to me, <laughs> like it's uh, a way of saying, well, unless you have a certain kind of experience or a certain set of experiences, then you don't have real religiousness. You, you haven't really experienced God or the transcendent. Well, yeah, I mean, she kind of is saying that last thing, and I kind of agree with that. Like, I think, you know, she's sort of saying, like, look, um, I don't know. So, like, you know, if somebody goes to church and they say the creed every week, kind of hoping that they'll believe in it being true, I, I respect that. You know, like, that's kind of like part of religious experience. So, I kind of want to acknowledge that, like, part of it is sort of you adopt these things and you kind of see where they where they lead you. Um, but I don't think you would want to. I don't think you want to adopt them out of nowhere. Like, I don't think you want to be like, I don't know. Um, I have this anxiety in my life about you know what it all means. So here's a thing, right? Here's this creed. And I'm just going to cling on to this creed. I want to clarify one thing, too, just because it was kind of related to what you raised. So you can have true beliefs um, that are still idols. So I just want to kind of like add that in there. Because just because you can, um, so it's ideology, but it can also be something that's totally true, but which you haven't really understood. So it becomes this, like the person that just says, all men are created equal, but support segregation in Fromm's example, um, has made a kind of idol of that statement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I don't know, maybe, um, can we think of like the, um, I don't think like a hedonistic version of like the void of carrying in the sense that when you have like a genuine experience with the void, like let not since you have an encounter with the word I and our relation, maybe it's a way of thinking that we want that so much. I mean, I don't think it's taking that genuine feeling and having this hedonistic desire so maybe that's where it comes from. Is that it comes from the issue of like, the genuine source of the part of the beast causes to go to the problem. So there's no ingenuine void, I guess. But there's always a genuine part to go to the problem. I think so. Yeah. 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 Sacred space in which I find 
of meaning that it gives, that's something that gives something to me, and that I can know and experience. Even though there's elements of ideology mixed into it, I'd rather want to say that these things are always interfused together, so we should constantly be trying to purify the things that are coming meaningful, other idolatrous components, rather than wholesale rejecting things for the void. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I wonder if I'm making this. Um, yeah, I might be making this too extreme. And part of this is colored by the fact that I was working on fashion originally. Yeah. And the people that I was reading and listening to, like I was listening to these people who had been in hate groups and they laughed and they were explaining, like, you have to like, rebirth their whole identity. And that's like a really dramatic passing through the void. Um, but. How, I mean, maybe it depends on you know how how idolatrous your idols are. Um, like how offended are you by you know somebody not saying the flag pledge would determine maybe the de degree to which you need to strip yourself of your American identity. I think that's right because it would be nice if we could just come up with some criteria and say these are the bad nationalists and these are the good nationalists. But isn't there something good and bad sort of getting molded in all of our positions? All of us are facing some idolatry. Yeah. And, but it's a matter of degree. Yeah. So the fascists are outside of pale mm -hmm. because of the degree to which the violence and illusion are, are um, interwoven with the position. Mm -hmm. That's the point to me. That's the point to me. I do want to say, like, I mean, I think that Believe about the world. Like there should be that some like stage of going through that. John, yes. did you work? Because there's strong two. We've tried to synthesize them. There's strong two very different. Strong on materialism, strong on oxygen, and strong on some form of Christian theology. I'm not familiar with it. And I think what we mean by the void depends on what we're drawing on. From a materialist perspective, I think it's got to be our own mortality, the, the limit, the limit of our life, the emptiness of the universe, the fact that there is no pre-given meaning to any of it, that's got to be the, the materialist work. I mean, the void from a sort of theological perspective, I keep thinking of things like uh, the idea of God being ineffable and therefore it being not impossible to ascribe any, yeah. legitimately describe any characteristics to God. They all become idolatrous because they're all, they're all sort of wrong. Or even in Taoist terms, you know, Tao that can be spoken is not the, is not the real Tao. I'm not sure which void I'm speaking. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I think it might be the same void but I, I could be wrong because, but I think. So Fromm is really, even though he's a Marxist, he's coming out of this very theological tradition. And he's using all of this um, you know, Jewish theology. And his vision of Marxism is all tied up with what he calls prophetic messianism. So we're building the messianic age, not in the sense of a messiah as a person, but yeah, the Jewish like sense of the, yeah, the, the messianic age, which is yeah. yeah. So there's this time that's coming, this mystical time. And so there's all that stuff in Fromm. And um, so I think there's like I think there's a sort of revealing of something by its absence is kind of the theme here. Like so I think for Fromm, like we look around at capitalism and we, we see the alienation, we see all these problems and the people suffering and so on. And this like reveals the need for this thing that's otherwise. And we orient ourselves in terms of seeking that thing that's otherwise in the future. Um, and there's very much the same kind of thing in Bay, although it's not about this sort of mysticism of the time of the future, but it's like, you know, the, the suffering of the present reveals that there's something divine. So kind of entering into the suffering and absence and confusion. Um, like I think about um, like I, when I teach um, the narrative like Frederick Douglass in my human nature class. Douglas has this weird passage where he's like praying to like a god who doesn't think exists. <laughs> and he's like, is there any god? Why aren't we fixing things? And you're not there. And, and I think that that's kind of vague because she's like, you know, this thing is absent, but the fact that I need it, it's like somehow revealing that 
it's going to come present itself. And we have, but we can't just pretend we think it's there and just be like, oh, it's there. We have to like acknowledge that we're experiencing it not being there. Students, we gotta yeah, throw your hand up. You need a stupid question. So, um, is all of this completely irrelevant? <laughs> I want to fix the world. I want to like stop hate groups or like get people to calm down about their country. Like, does anyone just do that, or am I just like up in my ivory tower, spilling my coffee? <laughs> yes. Uh, I think one thing that possibly we've been overlooking in this conversation is we've talked a lot about how the void is something we all try to fill with experience or a sense of belonging, and that's why we're seeing the rise in nationalist groups, but one thing we could kind of talk about is how we can use that yearning to fill ourselves with some experience or something to kind of go against white nationalists and focus in a more positive direction and say, uh, kind of inspire people to move forward in their life in beneficial ways instead of ways that isolate people from others and force people into the image of kind of the fanatic, where they become cold and resentful towards others, and instead they become more open and willing to support, or just do positive things. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if we could unite people around the excitement about questions. You know, like, I think it's like, um, you know, like Socrates is going on this kind of journey, he has this kind of confidence that he's gonna find something, right, even though he hasn't yet, and right? he keeps asking these questions thinking he might find something. Um, and when Fromm talks about the common struggle against idolatry, he talks about like living ideas, and can we unite people around living ideas? So can we, like when we say something like we're for, um, well in Fromm's case, it's we're saying we're for socialism. Like, can we, can we make that a project where people are saying, well, what if it means this? What if it means this? Can we do this rather than you know, here is our statement of principles. Come to our meetings, sign our statement of principles, sign a membership card, you will get the thing in the mail. You know, <laughs> which is the way a lot of social movements have worked, I think. Um, I don't know, does that kind of help or like? I, I think so, but it obviously it borders, not borders, but it hinges upon like who will get those like ideas, who will control basically the because obviously you can't have everyone in a social movement saying, I want to go this direction or else nothing will get done, but whoever's at the top enforcing those decisions and like what is prioritized and whatnot in the movement, so. Yeah, I mean, that's a big, and hopefully it'd be more democratic, but you know, so like I participated in Occupy Wall Street and that was supposed to be all consensus based, right? And like, you, you could not get a thing done. Like, I mean, like if you spent, you know, a week, you couldn't come up with a couple things you wanted to demand. And that was good. And you got to kind of witness people having discussions and things. But um, there was an incident in New York where they were like, they decided they had all this trash they were leaving behind. And all the businesses were getting ticked off at them. So they had this meeting, they're like, all right, we're gonna get trash cans. Consensus? Everyone's like, yes, trash cans. And then somebody says, okay, well, but we want to be sustainable, so we should probably get like biodegradable trash cans. And everyone's like, yes, yes, biodegradable trash cans, consensus, consensus. And then everyone's like, um, but they should also be fair trade, because we don't want biodegradable, you know, trash cans that are made by people who are like in exploited conditions. <laughs> they're like, okay, okay, like fair trade, biodegradable trash cans. And then, like, of course, like two months later, no trash cans. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so I don't know how to solve this. Um, but you know, I I want to err more on on the, on the side of Occupy Wall Street, but but we need like some way of yeah of organizing ourselves. Uh, as opposed to say fixating on something rather particular like a trash can or whatnot, perhaps we could leave something kind of vague, like say a firm disposition to move forward into positive experiences in our mm -hmm. life as opposed to just say, oh, you need to go up and talk to people that you think look nice or treat you well. It can just be rather open to interpretation. And while you can't have some variety in the movement, it just can't veer towards like some radical thing that's just kind of downhill. Mm -hmm. That might help. Um, growing up, everybody I knew made a distinction.
tradition of patriotism and nationalism. So when I was a kid, everybody was like, I'm a patriot, not a nationalist. It didn't matter if you were liberal, conservative, whatever. Everybody was like, patriot, not nationalist. And I don't know if we really know what that means. Um, I think some of our patriotism is nationalism. But it was this agreed upon distinction. And then over the past year, I've had people telling me they're nationalists. And they just, like, casually, like, that's a normal thing, like, it means patriot to them or something. And I'm curious, like, if any of you experienced this, if you've noticed this, do you think that that's happening? And if, if there has been a shift in the language, like, what does it mean? And maybe I'm wrong about this. I pulled my freshman, all three of my freshman reasoning classes, and I'm like, is there a difference between patriotism and nationalism? I'm like, yes. <laughs> What do they say? What? They think patriotism, well, there were some differences, but most of them think patriotism is about thinking the country could be wrong and loving it and wanting to make it better, and nationalism being about thinking the country is always perfect and the best, something like that. What's the name of the is, is that descriptively true of nationalists? Would nationalists say everything my country does is exactly right? I, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, because even somebody that's like super attached to the country has a Club. Uh, I only send out about four emails a semester, so you won't be bombarded. Um, and uh, we have a series of talks on women, scholars on women in the early church coming up in just two weeks. So uh, stay tuned.